bigger that might help me a lot. Because like it's all uh, bunched up and really small, and I think that's why I'm having a hard time reading it. Okay. <clears throat> that's a good idea. I might do that. That's the normal size font, but perhaps a large one would be better. Like that. The Sun Town and the Politics of Mexico is very easy to read. Compared yeah, that's to awesome. Because some of the pages will be like half empty with black space, and like if we could maximize the fonts for those pages, like mm -hmm. it would be amazing. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. <clears throat> well, usually because I had a whole three days to prepare yeah. for teaching this class, I'm kind of been a Johnny come lately. You're like son of a gun, but I'm trying to get the best possible for you guys to help you guys out. Okay, so Santa Ana and uh, politics of Mexico. Uh, he was born down in Jalpa in Veracruz in 1794. He became a cadet in the army at age 15 and basically made the military his career. After that, um, he was wounded. His first wound came when he was shot in an arrow by uh, some uh, Native Americans down in Mexico. And early in his military career, he came to Texas to put down the Gutierrez McGee expedition or the Republican Army of the North with uh, Joaquin de Mendondo as his leader. The, yeah, there it is. And in January of uh, 1832, well, in 1829, he retired for, he went from being the military governor of Veracruz to being its regular governor when um, it was pacified. And he got kind of bored of, the, of that, so by January of 1832, he convinces the military com commander of the forces there to uh, lead his uh, garrison in a revolt against uh, Mexico and the president, Bustamante, and they throw out Bustamante, and then Santa Ana is elected president April 1st, 1833. And even though he is a very astute politician, he's kind of, well, this just shows how smart he is, because when he wins the presidency, he doesn't assume the office. He lets his vice president, uh, Gomez Farias, or Valentino Farias, take the office of president to do all these liberal reforms. And once everybody kind of accepts the liberal reforms, then he'll come in and then he'll back out when more changes need to be made with having uh, Farias as uh, governor. Because basically he was really concerned about uh, the, the officials of the Catholic Church and other powerful officials in Mexico City that may not like, like the liberal changes he's making, where he's giving more power to the states. Indeed, um, there's a modern example of that uh, in um, Saudi Arabia. You know that about, what was it, a year or a year and a half ago, Saudi Arabia gave women the right to drive? Uh, without anybody else in the car, which is like totally revolutionary for Saudi Arabia. But the king said, well, it's my prince, it's the prince's idea. So I'll let him take the blame, and if things go wrong, we can change it back. But, you know, the prince is going to be the purveyor of all these liberal ideas when it could have been the king, but he's not going to take the blame, he's going to say it was his son. And then people will be more, oh, well, okay. Well, finally, he has enough of it and replaces the liberal constitution of 1824 that uh, gave, the, um, gave all the federal reforms with the powers to the states. And he decides to become dictator because they had that one deal in the constitution where the president could use emergency powers to consolidate all the power to himself. That's what he did. He replaced the Constitution of 1824 with the Siete Leyes, which basically gave uh, Mexico the NADF extreme power over all the states. And of course, you had lots of states that were in revolution against this. Zacatecas is, in, I mean, California is in one of them. But Zacatecas, Coahuila, Texas, and the Yucatan all 
were in revolt of this new assertion of centralized power over the states. And so basically he had to go into Zacatecas and basically when he put that one down, he let all of his soldiers uh, kind of just rape and pillage the capital city. After it was done, you're teaching them, hey guys, don't rise up against me. He, there's a civil war going on in uh, Coahuila, which was our sister state. And we're just, you know, letting it happen because nothing's ever happened to us. Here's Tejas in Coahuila. You can see Coahuila is very, very small. There's Tejas, that was the original size of Texas from the Oasis River up. It wasn't all the way down to the Rio Grande. And in a trip up here to check things out, uh, Colonel Juan Almonte, who was an investigator for Gomez Farias, he came up here to Texas and he found that everything was pretty good. Indeed, the settlements were prospering. The colonists seemed content. There was really no evidence of disloyalty. And in 1833 and 1834, the state government had been very beneficial to Texas. The law against any non-native born Mexican engaging in merchandising had been repealed. So there were more opportunities now for the settlers. And instead of just having one deputy in the Mexican, uh, in the state Congress, of course, we have, we had three. We also had three official departments, the Department of Bejar, the Department of San Felipe and Nacogdoches. English was actually recognized as an official language for official purposes. Religious tolerance was granted for the settlers of Texas. And a court system with trial by a jury of your peers was recognized for Texas. So steps were being taken to satisfy the population. But is everything okay? No. Why? Because there's trouble in the state government that's developing. A quarrel between Saldillo and Monclova over which one was to be the correct capital of Coahuila. Uh, Zabdillo was way down here. Monclova was much further to the north, which would have made it much more convenient for rule over Tejas, as well as Coahuila. But in March of 1833, in a quarrel over the capital of the state government of Coahuila began when the legislature moved its capital from southeastern uh, Saltillo to Monclovia in the north. Well, in response to this, uh, there's kind of a hub rebel government that stays in operation at Saltillo. But Santa Ana goes ahead and he supported the capital city of Monclova. Which was great until April of 1835. When the Monclova, uh, when the uh, Coahuila State Legislature at Monclova was critical of Santa Ana. 
Santana didn't like that, so they moved back to capital to Saltillo. And he sent his brother-in-law, Martin Perfecto de Cos, up there to break up the government. Now, as the army is marching up there, the state officials and the governor, our governor was Agustin Vizca, they weren't stupid. They wanted to hustle Buck and try and make it up to San Antonio de Bejar and make that the new capital city. But Cos uh, caught at least the governor and was able to arrest him. But other state officers and land speculators were able to successfully flee. And the new centralist governor, supported by uh, Santa Ana, Governor Rafael Ica y Mesquiz, moves the capital city back to Saltillo. Oh, and believe it or not, uh, well, I guess I should say this, during this little squabble, uh, Texas actually sent Tejas actually sent about um, 76 to 80 people to fight uh, against the nationalist troops uh, to keep the uh, capital at Moldova. Oh, and by the way, you know why Texas is a Lone Star State? Here's our state flag. When we were Coahuila in Tejas, it's two stars, two states, and basically we just ripped one of those stars off and became the Lone Star State. Now guys, with uh, everything kind of settled down, our pacify in the revolting uh, province of Coahuila is pacified Zacatecas, he pacified Coahuila. Guess who's next on Santana's hit list? Texas. Because he wants to exert authority over Tejas once again. And in January of 1833, 1835, excuse me, Santana sent a small detachment of soldiers to Inouye to enforce the collection of customs and tariffs in Galveston. Now there was also another collection point which was at Fort Velasco at the Brazos. And the collector at uh, Velasco and the Brazos collected tonnage duties only. While the officers at Galveston and Anahuac that had the support of troops insisted on the payment of all duties for the ships. Now Andrew Brit there's Martin Perfecto de Cos, there's Andrew Briscoe, who was a merchant, thought that this was totally unfair, and they demanded that no more connections could be made at um, that port until collections were uniform in all areas of Texas. There's a subsequent fisticuffs with the Mexican soldiers. And which uh, Texan was wounded and Briscoe and another citizen were in prison. Now meanwhile, General Cos, who was the commandant of that area that included Texas, had heard of the threatening uh, attitude that some Texans had 
He proceeded to reinforce the garrison at Anahuac. And he wrote a letter to uh, Captain Antonio Tenerio, the commandant of the Anahuac, to be resolute and of good cheer because reinforcements were coming. Well, the courier that was carrying that letter from the interior of Mexico up to uh, Anahuac, he stops at San Felipe, at San Felipe d'Ostin, on June 21st. I remember during this time, uh, Stephen F. Austin isn't in Texas. He's getting out of prison down in Mexico City making his way back up here. Well, the war party is San Felipe. They capture this uh, courier and they take the message. And they read the dispatcher. And even though there was strong opposition to it, the war party favored drastic action. And they elected J.B. Miller, who was the political chief of the department of the Brazos. And they passed resolutions authorizing William B. Travis to collect a force and drive away the garrison at Anahuac. So he gets about 20 to 30 men and they go and they capture, they force Anahuac to surrender. The guy's not even a shot is fired. But um, Tenorio surrenders his men and that was on the morning of June 30th and he had about 44 men and they released all the prisoners. Well, how did the people of Texas react to this victory? Guys, the people of Texas were, what the, did you just do? The people of Texas remanded William B. Travis for his action. It was denounced at Columbia on June 28th. where the people emphatically denounced Travis's march to Anahuac, an act that was calculated to involve the citizens of Texas in conflict with the central government. They pledged their loyalty to Mexico, and they asked their political chief to send a ditch dispatch to General Colts, assuring him of their loyalty to Mexico. At a meeting at San Felipe on July 14th and 15th, they passed similar resolutions. Even J.B. Miller, the guy who was put in charge of doing this thing, even he writes a letter of apology to General Colts. Now, why do you think all these guys were saying you apologize, man. Had life been good for the Texans since 1832? Well, they, English was now accepted as an official language. They, hey, if you weren't totally 100% Catholic, that was okay. Uh, there was limited in the decree of April 6th. 1833 had been, I mean, 1830 had been repealed. Um, Non-Mexicans could now operate merchandise uh, stores. Things had been kind of good. And guys, what had happened to Zacatecas? They'd gotten wiped out in the revolt against Santa Ana. What had happened to Coahuila, where 74 guys even went down to help fight for them? Guys, the, they got slaughtered, all right? This guy, you're ruining a good thing. 
chill out, don't do it. And guys, by this time, of course, he wasn't really in the mood to forgive us. He was pretty tired of it. Indeed, he immediately issued an arrest warrant for Lorenzo de Zavala. Now, if you remember that name before, he was basically a land man that was out in East Texas, but before he had been there, he was originally born down in the Yucatan. And he had been a verbal critic of Santa Ana. A lot of people didn't like him that were with Santa Ana and the Centralist Party. Um, then uh, Colonel Ugartachea, the commander of Behar, sent a list of offenders to Kos, including F.W. Johnson, Samuel Williams, Robert N. Williamson, and William B. Travis. And General Kos insisted that the colonial officials arrest these men and turn them over to the military without trial. Also, he totally refused to meet with the Peace Commission that had come all the way out from San Antonio to try to pacify him. But uh, turning over these citizens to a uh, military court or a trial without a jury um, was unthinkable. That you had not only people refuse to turn them over, you started to have some people going out giving inflammatory speeches against Mexico. Just like in the American Revolution, committees of correspondence that spread information on the movement of enemy troops began to arise in Texas. I mean, if these things hadn't been formed, there would have been no way that we could have kind of been able to have ruled ourselves or to have carried out military maneuvers. The first committee of correspondence is established at Mina. Which is also now known as Bastrom. Second one is formed at Gonzales. And before the end of the summer, nearly every precinct had such an organization. And these committees were responsible for a decision to bring together representatives of the municipalities for a consultation. That was to be held at Washington on the Brazos on October 15th. Now, what was the purpose of this consultation? Uh, basically, the only instructions, this is what they 
had to decide. Basically, they had to see if they could have peace, uh, if it was to be obtained in constitutional terms, and to prepare for war if war was inevitable. So guys, we're starting getting ready to be prepared to have to go to war, should that be the cause. Three weeks later, Austin returns. But also three weeks later, we receive news that Cos is going to be arriving in San Antonio de Bejar. And this destroyed the last chances for peace. On September 19th, the Central Committee reinforced the call for a consultation and added war is our only resource. There is no other remedy. We must defend our right ourselves and our country by force of arms. So guys, maybe not everybody, but some have decided what's going to have to go down in Texas. Now, why do we have a revolution? Well, many studies of the causes of the Texas Revolution reveal striking resemblances to the American Revolution. I mean, in both uh, instances, it can be traced to a superior government asserting its authority after the colonists had learned to expect salutary neglect. Now, do you all know what salutary neglect is? Anybody know what salutary neglect is? Well, you do, even though you say you don't. Salutary neglect is how many people here have driven to San Antonio? One? Only one person here? Nobody has been to Austin? Oh, two? But driven, not flown. Okay. So the speed limit the whole way is about 80 once you get out of town, right? Yeah. So nobody here has ever gone faster than 80? on I-35? I mean, I don't have No, but you can only go 80 miles an hour. Right? Theory. But everybody's going 85, 87, 90. Until, what? Until you see a cop. I've been driving. And cops know what the game is. And it's that's the period of salutary neglect. Where, eh, it's, eh, we're overlooking the rules. We're overlooking the rules. You know, because remember, they didn't have to pay tariffs or anything up in Texas for the longest. And so they got used to kind of, all right, this kind of lax enforcement of laws. Uh, like I said, uh, customs duties and custom collectors played important parts in both stories. The Texans resented Mexican troops being quartered among them, just as the American colonials resented the British redcoats. So were there any other reasons why we had um, a revolution here in Texas? Well, a lot of, this is especially true in the modern world, a lot of people like to point to slavery. That, oh, the only reason why we had um, Texas had a revolt is because basically it wanted to join the rest of the southern United States and give uh, slavery more power. Have you all ever heard that kind of argument before? Yes? No? Maybe? Guys, that's not an old argument. First guy that came up with that argument was Benjamin Lundy, who actually visited Texas. This was a guy that William Lloyd Garrison, the guy who was the abolitionist that was big uh, right before and during and after the Civil War in fighting for the rights of the newly freed men. 
Uh, he said Benjamin Lundy was the first abolitionist who gave his life for this cause. Um, basically, he decried that he was born to a Quaker family uh, in 1789. Uh, he believed that slavery was a huge problem. Um, he visited uh, Texas. He made three visits to Texas. Um, he concluded that Texas was an island, dot, dot, dot. Lundy charged that the revolution was a slaveholder's plot to take Texas away from Mexico and to add slavery territory to the United States. Um, he began publishing this as early as August in 1836 in Philadelphia. Um, he won many influential adherents, but guys, like I told you, Ed, the biggest guy I know who did this was the guy who published the recent novel, and I can't think of his name now that I've got one D in my mind. Um, but guys, every single historian that has tried to say it's, the slavery is a big issue, I'm not able to prove it. They have lots of great arguments. And, you know, there was a supporting, but look at it, even in, uh, Mexico was working with Texas. They gave them an exemption. You had the, um, you had the uh, state government of Coahuil, Tejas, that when finally, yeah, slavery is ended, well, they try to work around by putting on that, well, now you can make them indentured servants. And then, but see, each time they were shortening it, because finally, uh, Coahuila said, well, you can't have a lifetime contract. Now it's only 10 years. Some people have tried to cite cultural differences that the Anglos and Tejanos didn't get well along together. Guys, that's not true at all. Back then, they got along very good. Indeed, you had Stephen F. Austin was Esteban Austin. He learned Spanish. Uh, he knew how to move in the political circles. James Bowie, that's a picture of good old Jim Bowie right there. Uh, he married the daughter of the political chief of Texas, except he was Santiago Bowie. So, uh, boom, boom, boom. Uh, uh, basically, back then, a lot of the animosity between Anglo-Americans and Tejanos did not exist. However, um, once the revolution started again, uh, ethnic differences made peaceful resolution unlikely. Uh, final explanation places the responsibility for the revolution on the failure of Mexico to establish uh, state and democratic governments. A stable and democratic governments, a failure that led to unpredictability, tyranny, and dictatorship. These were chaotic years for Mexico, and Santa Ana's lust for power did bring revolution within many parts of Mexico, not just Texas. And many Texans lacking a basic faith that a democratic government and tranquil prosperity was possible in the foreseeable future made the decision for rebellion, revolution, and ultimately independence. But, of course, just like in the American Revolution, where you have the rule of thirds in the American Revolution, a third of the people were for it, a third of the people were against it, and a third of the people said, hey, I don't care, just keep it out of my yard. Guys, uh, it was about the same here in Texas. Oh, and by the way, guys, Benjamin Lundy, because he was kind of an extremist for his time, that would, treating his works would be like um, someone today.
Um, that would be like someone today uh, looking at the works of Rush Limbaugh to show what was going on in America. Guys, would you get a good view if you just read the works of Rush Limbaugh? Talk show host, con real conservative guy. Would you probably get a clear view of what was really going on? No, because he's an agitator. What if you only listen to, I can't think of the guy on the left that's on, who's a real, um, let's say Michael Moore. I don't even know if y'all know who Michael Moore is anymore. Who's a, Rachel Maddow. Do y'all know who Rachel Maddow is? A reporter for CNN or have, I don't never watch her, but. Or if someone got like, if someone wanted to find out what was going wrong right now, they talked to like one of the protesters uh, up in Portland. Or do you think they'd give a good holistic wide view of what was really going on or would they be impassioned about their cause? That would kind of blind them to putting out what was really going on. That's about the same thing as Benjamin Lundy. Now, so guys, basically uh, our next lecture is going to be about the Texas Revolution. We're in a kind of weird spot because, like I said, I did a whole documentary on uh, the first battle of the uh, Texas Revolution.